trying to be I was trying to be all relaxed and sort of flashy sitting like this then I knocked this off my desk it went flying and then I went live and then here I was but I'm here now hello everyone I'm just waiting for people to show up because if because if there's no one this is going to be sad video in it just me sitting here by myself talking to myself just saying hello how are you all All is well. All is well. Hello. I just took out a couple of pens that came in. And when I say a couple, I really mean a couple. There aren't that many. But there are two. There are two inks. I have a book that I thought was interesting that I might show you. And if there's any things we should talk, if there are any things that we should talk about, then we can. Hello, hello from Portugal, Portugal. That's um, far away. Isn't it very late in Portugal? Hello, Ivan, hello. I don't know why I make this sort of go away motion, but you know what I mean. Hello, Ivan. <clears throat> what have we all? For some reason, I can't speak today. What have we all been up to today? 2 a.m. That is dedication, and I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here at 2 a.m. What have we been doing today? I'll tell you a little bit what I was doing today. I was taking a two-day training to become a trainer in a program called Basic Health actually health basics, I think, um, which just teaches about healthy food and such, uh, which I thought was interesting. So that's something that we can then offer our students. So that was what I was doing today. Um, I'm also happy that the weather here has improved a little bit to the extent that it was a bit rainy the past days, but last week it was very hot. And there were some days where the temperature was 36 degrees Celsius or more. And although some people really love the sun and heat, I'm not really one of them. Um, with this fair skin color, I crisp up in no time. So yeah, that didn't work too well. But today was much more pleasant. It's been pleasant. There's been rain now. It's a lot more pleasant. Jenny asks, will you continue? That was not an exasperated sigh. I just took a deep breath, but then it sounded like a sigh. It was like, <sighs> Jenny asked that. That's not, that's not what I was intending to do. Jenny's asked, will you continue the stoicism vids after you're done with this book? Yes, I will. And what I was thinking, there are a few options. One person asked me to maybe go over Boethius's um, book, which I'm not sure, but I'm now completely blanking on the title. Um, I don't know why. Any, anyway, Boethius is interesting because it was a Roman author who wrote a kind of poem in prison while he was awaiting a death sentence. And it's kind of stoicism influenced. So that will be an interesting thing to do at some point. Another thing that I was considering, and that I might do something like that first, is do something uh, with Seneca. Now, Seneca is a little difficult for a couple reasons, and I'll try to be brief because not everyone's equally into the Stoicism videos, but in a nutshell, there are the three great Roman Stoics, Epictetus, who was actually, actually, Greek, but kind of also, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, he, he, um, he, he, he lived at some point in, 
in Rome. Um, and there's Marcus Aurelius, of course, who we're going over now, but then there's also Seneca. And then there's Musonius Rufus, but Musonius Rufus is a bit complicated because that was actually Epictetus' teacher, but but we don't have a lot of material left from Musonius Rufus. Seneca is interesting, but he was very eclectic in his approach. But he has written letters, moral letters, to a friend who may not actually have been real. Those letters may just have been kind of meant as an introduction to Stoicism. Uh, so I was thinking it might be interesting to go over those letters and i have an, a translation of the letters by anthony long who is one of the stoic translators of our time so it might be interesting to go over those and it would be a letter of time or something yeah, i mean a letter of video something like that so that was the long answer the short answer is yes i will continue uh, someone ate katsu curry i should point out that i do really like katsu curry it's very good especially with the crispy that's just that's really really nice adam was playing with his new visconti homo sapiens that's always a good thing yeah very good ms woodhouse was cleaning pens and getting ready for the next semester yeah that's always an important thing as well and jenny is making a new shelf for the dinner area well here you see all the various things we can do um yeah, okay, this this is interesting. Um, someone here asks, what are my ideas uh, on the Jungian shadow and how that relates to, to Stoicism? Um, when it comes to the shadow, right, the, the sort of darker side of of your personality. I think what a Stoic would say is that everybody has a, a darker side, but the, the one of the tenets of Stoicism is to live virtuously and, and to therefore try and um, at the very least not give in, I would say, to, to a darker side of, of your personality and your whole psyche and, and being. I also think that it's it's a difficult thing to do and it depends on how far you want to take that. But I think as I said, everybody has a darker side to their 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 personality, to their their psyche. And that can be as simple as just not knowing when to stop eating chocolate, so to speak. Right? It can some be something very dark. It can also be something like that, a habit like that. Clearly I'm influenced by the healthy eating training I was taking today. But I mean that kind of stuff that that is real too, and those are everyday struggles too. And I think it would it would be important in the mind of, of a stoic to try and and get that under control as much as you can, because giving into the the, the darker sides of, of your personality will, in the end, not lead to a fulfilling and rich life. I would say, but that's that's probably what I would say in in a nutshell. John says, hello, Stephen from Missouri. Been following you since your early days. Thank you for all the great videos. You're very welcome. It's uh, it's always nice to, I mean, it's, it's nice to interact with all viewers, obviously. But it's very nice to interact, and that happens once in a while with people who have been watching the videos for a very long time. I think I have changed a lot in the decade that I've been doing this now, um, and so the videos, obviously. And it's interesting to, to me, I don't know if it's interesting to anyone else, but it's interesting to me to see that, that progression, because I do think it's a progression, I do consider it a positive progression. But it's interesting to see that that whole development. And sometimes when I watch my older videos, I'm a little startled, not only because I look a lot younger, but I mean, also because they're so long. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, here we have uh, Alex, and Alex says been a fan since 2015. Yeah, it also goes quite a quite a um, way back. Yeah, yeah, 2015. Yeah. And Alex also asked, would you entertain a pen, uh, fan visitor from a nearby city? It has happened. It has happened. 
uh, it it depends a bit on what the schedule is where we are typically what what ends up is that if people want to meet me i try to set up a meeting in such a way that there is a um that it coincides with with a meeting from the local pen club now red deer where i live doesn't have a pen club but calgary does and then it, it can be it can be kind of fun because i mean it's not i always look at it this way i I understand that I, I create the videos and the content and that people watch that and that's great. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a guy, you know? And I, I think that if you're interested in pens, it's, it's often nice to, to then also meet other like-minded people. And typically those things I think are uh, quite successful. So those kinds of meetings that, that does happen, not necessarily a whole lot, but it does happen. And of course, as, but, you know, I was going to say there always are, but in reality, there used to be pen shows, and I think we are slowly but steadily picking that up again. I very much look forward to seeing how the whole pen show landscape will develop. Uh, I'm talking in pandemic terms. And what will happen, how that will pan out, uh, how that will, quite quite simply, what that will be like. Because a massive room filled to the brim with people who are all touching the same things. Uh, kind of sounds like a recipe for disaster to me. I just read on a Dutch news site uh, that, there were, that Dutch uh, COVID measures are being relaxed. Uh, and uh, I want to cite the number 180 young people were infected with, with COVID because they all went to the same sort of night nightclub bar whatever uh, area and all ended up with with infection so i mean i i do think it is i know that covid stuff is, a, is an interesting topic that people have very different feelings about and that's okay but i mean you do see in those cases right that, that we're not quite out of the woods yet so looking at that uh looking at it from that perspective i i I wonder what pen shows will be like, especially right now, especially something really big, like say a DC pen show in August. It's interesting, yeah. What else do we have? Um, Anish asks, any plans for statistics videos? It might happen. Um, I will be teaching statistics again this year in winter, and I will also be teaching statistics labs this year for the first time. And I wonder, I was considering doing something like some sort of screen recording of SPSS or something, but I'm, but I'm, this is very preliminary. And that's of course a very specific uh, topic, but, but maybe, yeah, maybe. Let's see what else we have. Um, Will you also review the Mont Blanc Solitaire Blue Hour that Gourmet Pens just reviewed? I'm curious on your take on it. Uh, I haven't heard anything about me receiving that, but it, that might happen. I don't know. Um, I am awaiting some, some pens coming in, so who, who knows? It might happen. Have you seen the pen Duchessa 1935 Antiqua? I was wondering if you would be reviewing it someday. Um, I can't. I will just quickly Google this pen because I have not seen this. So we just want to see what it what it looks like. Um, the fact that I have not heard of it is is not promising uh, in in me reviewing it anytime soon. That doesn't mean it will not happen. It's just that I had never I never heard of it. But. It looks like this is a brand that I had never heard of, which is not a reflection on the brand, which is a reflection on me. There's, but there's so many brands that I've not heard of. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll make a quick note here because if it's a whole, it's always fun to find a company. that I've not reviewed of, not reviewed before, whose pens I've not reviewed before. Those are lever fillers, so that looks very interesting because that's a very vintage uh, filling system. I'm going to contact the company and I will see what I can do. Hello, Jude, and always nice to see you. Um,
Waski Squirrel says, I'm cooking supper and surprised to have you along. Well, you know, whenever I show up, it's always a nice, well, let me rephrase that. It's always a surprise. And to some people, a nice surprise. To others, uh, to some people, a nice surprise. Moving on. Um, might using wet and dry for nibs and inks confusing? We have to we have to elaborate on that point because I'm not I'm not fully sure that of that yet. Are you still a fan of Japanese katanas and different swords? Sure. I mean I enjoy them, but I don't have any at the moment. But the interest is there, and I think it's always been there, and that's not really gone, it's just that I don't really don't really have the the backyard right now. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? How many fountain pens do you have? Yeah, I was just looking at that. I'm doing a count, so bear with me. Thirty, the count says, if I'm not leaving out any. Call it thirty. I'm trying to clear out. Did I mention that? SBREbrown.com slash four dash sale. There's a couple on sale right now. How much for the Delta Roma Imperial? Yeah, that's a nice pen. I'm not I'm not parting with that one yet. That's um it's a uh, it's it's a very pleasant pen. I have it here. I shall pull it out just to uh, make things generally annoying for you. Uh, it's a, it's a very pleasant pen and it's it's nice it's large. Here we have a, a safari so it's it's a big pen and it's incredibly comfortable. I really find this a very very comfortable pen. I saw at some point that Tom Esterich of um, penboard.de was selling one it's for, it's for sold now so don't don't you don't have to rush there. But what he did on a lathe was just turn the um, uh, the section into an hourglass shaped section. And he said that that made it more comfortable to a lot of people. And I can see that because it's a very bulbous section. It's really barrel shaped, uh, which which makes quite a bit, but it's, but it's lovely one and, it, and even posts. And it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely a big pen. It's a lot of pen. It's very comfortable. This is a, a this was a relatively expensive one, but that's because this is the, um, the demo they did for um, uh, Airline International. And that was that was quite limited. There's a number somewhere, twenty five. Yeah, so that's quite limited. So these are these are a bit hard to find. There was also a transparent yellow one, and then there is the ebonite ones. The ebonite ones were relatively speaking much more affordable. The reason I ended up with this was I couldn't find any other ones, and I wanted I wanted the model. So it happens. Yeah, I'm taking a sip here. So I'm just. Was a really I was making weird noise. I sound like an old man. <sighs> Youth these days. Sorry. <clears throat> Let me continue. Just want you to know I've been very positively affected by your stoicism videos. They've helped me through a couple of very difficult times. So thank you sincerely. Well, you're very welcome. But that's the reason I started to do them because I too have found that a very helpful way of thinking. And it's not for everyone, but nothing is. It's not for every, they say not for anyone. It's, it, it is for some people. It's not for everyone. Uh, and, and again, not, not nothing is, right? Some, some things work for that person, other things work for them. So I have found it very helpful. Uh, it's easier to use some day than other days. But on the whole, I agree that it can be very helpful. And if that's a, I think if you are a, a very cognitive person and that's not a value judgment but but if you just if you think a lot and if you enjoy thinking which some people don't right but if you find yourself going over things cognitively a lot then i i think stoicism can be very helpful because it is such a a rational approach a very cognitive approach to everyday issues as opposed to a more emotive uh, 
approach, which can help well for other people, right? And of course, there should be a bit of a balance, but but you know what I'm trying to say. Some people benefit more from very loving kindness type things, and and that's that's great if if that's what works for you. But that's not that's not what what would really work for me either. Yeah. Becky asks, what type of books do you like? I I read quite a lot of non-fiction and I used to read a lot of fiction and at some point and I'm not exactly sure when that tipping point occurred but at some point I moved more towards non-fiction and that can be about different things I think if you if you follow me on Instagram for example <clears throat> My Carl Sagan phase has been fairly obvious because I was I was posting penned uh, quotes of him quite a lot. Um, that's nonfiction, which which I really enjoyed, sort of cosmology type stuff, which I think is quite interesting. But I also read other things. Um, right now, I I was I have read a couple of books, and I'm, I still have a couple on the shelf uh, on the the British special air service because I it started off with reading Bravo to Zero, which was just a, a Gulf War mission that went wrong. And it turns out there's a lot to be said about that mission and the way it has been reported on and, and portrayed in books. And I found that kind of interesting, the whole story behind it, so to speak. Yeah. So that's something that right now is, is going on. <clears throat> Well, just, just sorry, there's always a bit of a delay in this, but um, they we're talking about the Duchessa still. It's a modern, is it Duchessa? Duchessa. No, Duce, no. Someone who's from Italy, please, please correct me. Uh, it is a modern pen made with vintage nib, lever, and clip. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can, um, um, if I, if I can contact that company. It always depends a bit, right? Some companies are very exciting to, no, sorry, are very excited to see their work reviewed, and they immediately want to collaborate and all kinds of things. Some companies say, "Yeah, which is not interested," or I don't hear back from them at all. So I don't know. It always, it's always always um, an interesting interaction to to see whether companies want to work with me. It's, and I I also understand that some companies say, "Yeah, we don't we don't really want our stuff reviewed. Like we we don't care." And that's that's perfectly understandable. So. We shall see. Andrew says, your video on using grit pads to smooth nibs has been very useful to me on several occasions. Thank you for these types of how-to videos. Yeah, I, I sometimes feel like I want to do more, but the reality is that I'm not really a pen repair person. Now, what I would find interesting is that in the Calgary Pen Club, uh, we have someone who's, in my mind, very good at working with nibs. And if all goes well, I may have dinner with him tomorrow. And I will bring up this topic because just like I did the, the video on left-handed writing with Sinister Peter, who is someone from Calgary, it might be interesting to do a nib tuning video with Wacko Jacko uh, and see, I think that would be interesting. Because the thing is, when it comes to nib tuning, I can do very basic things. But when it comes to more complicated things, I'm kind of out of my element I, because I'm not, I haven't studied that stuff in enough detail to, to, to be very clear on what I'm doing. So I, I, have, I have found myself recently, not recently, the past couple of years gravitating more towards let the nibmeisters do the nibmeister work because they know exactly what they're doing and don't mess too much with your own nibs. Again, smoothing something, that's pretty straightforward and that can be quite helpful uh, or easy to do. So those videos, if they were helpful, that's good. When it comes to more complicated stuff, I, I don't feel, I don't think I should be doing videos on stuff that I don't feel very comfortable about and don't feel very, I'm very hesitant to use the word expert, but I feel like I have a certain expertise in because then things just become weird. And then you're kind of posing and pretending that you know what you're talking about. You're not, if you're not, like in this case, I would be not, I would not be, then I probably shouldn't do that. So anyway, that's my thought. If anyone has, if you would find this interesting, 
a sort of collaborative video with someone who does know what he's talking about with nibs, then let me know, and then I will use that as leverage tomorrow when I speak to Jack. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good evening from Hershey. Hello. Do you think Sailor will make a King Eagle nib again? Why and why not? I think the problem with the very fancy nibs, I mean, they have kind of restarted producing some of their interesting specialty nibs. I think the issue with the very fancy nibs, like the King Eagle and the King Cobra, is that the audience for them may be relatively small, but more important than that, I think, is that they are a tremendous amount of work because there's such specialized nibs with all the layers and the things sticking out. And the, I don't know if the margin for a nib like that is big enough for a company like Sailor to start to produce them again. I do think they would make a fortune because there's a lot of people who want them. But there's a difference between wanting that and, and also actually purchasing it because they're also very expensive. So I, I don't know if that if that will happen again. I haven't heard that it will, but I haven't heard that it won't. And Sailor doesn't consult me on these things, so we'll just have to see. But it is an interesting, um, I find it an interesting development that Sailor is making those other specialty nibs again that they have produced doing that. Because you can say a lot about Sailor but those are very special nibs that are very interesting to use. And I do think there's a market for that. I mean, everyone can make a broad nib, so to speak, but, but making a Concord nib, or an, uh, uh, you know, th that is a very different story. So I do think there's a market for that. Is Waterman Florida blue similar to Mont Blanc Royal Blue? I want to say that I, I haven't used Mont Blanc Royal Blue in a while. Royal blue in a while. Yeah, that was a sentence. I want to say that I remember the Mont Blanc Royal Blue as slightly more purple. It's not a purple, but relatively speaking, a bit more of a purple hue to it than the Florida Blue, which is more of a darker blue. The Florida Blue is quite nice because it can have a little bit of sheen in the right nib and on the right paper, which I thought was quite nice. If you're in the market for a dark blue or a, you know, just a blue, I have found Leonardo Blue to be a very attractive shade and a well-behaved ink. So just saying, I know that was not your question, but I'm just saying. Anish asks, which new pen has really impressed you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, there are a couple. I, I recently got in, I forgot to take them out, but um, I recently got in a couple of pens uh, by Ben Walsh, a Gravitas pens. And to be honest, I was impressed by them. It's an aluminum pen. Uh, it's properly machined. It writes very nicely. It's uh, Yovo nib. And they're comfortable. I don't think it always has to, one second, I don't think it always has to be an incredibly expensive pen or a super refined celluloid or something like that. It doesn't always have to be a very exotic filling system. I think if you make a good product that's solid, then that will work. I once saw, I'm really confused now, it was either an Oxford address or a Cambridge address with Marco Pierre White, the chef who actually trained Gordon Ramsay. And you should watch that video. It's something like 45 minutes. He tells his whole life story, but he's a fantastic storyteller. So you're sitting there wide eyed, just listening to his story. It's super interesting. But near the end, someone asks him something like, would you recommend people to start in the restaurant business? And I, I mean, I'm, I'm not quoting verbatim here because it's a video I, I watched once. And his answer always stood out to me because he said something like, yes, but you have to do something that you're good at. So 
if you're good at making fish and chips, he, he was a three Michelin star chef, right? If you're good at making fish and chips, then do that because you'll, you'll be known for that and you do a very good job at doing that. And I find with pens, I'm, I'm, someone should take this clip and then send it to Ben. I'm not saying that Gravitas pens are the fish and chips of the pen world. But what I am trying to say is it's a straightforward pen, but it's a well-made pen. And I would take personally a straightforward but well-made pen any day of the week over a super gaudy, incredibly expensive model with all kinds of things tacked onto it just to make it resemble a great character, if you know what I mean. And I think that that is what really matters to me. And I, I find myself gravitating a bit towards that. And I have some expensive pens. This is true. I have some expensive pens. But I like them for what they are. And that can sometimes be a very simple thing. Some of them are cartridge converter filled pens. There's nothing fancy about them, except for something that particularly appeals to me. But that's a whole different discussion. How about, okay, how about using wet and dry for inks, then high and low flow for nibs to make things clearer? You mean using the terms wet and dry for inks and high and low flow for nibs, as opposed to saying this is a wet nib or this is a dry nib? If that is what you mean, I think it's a good idea. It's the same thing that continuously um, confuses me about flex and i still i still keep messing it up because there's flex and then there's springiness and then the softness and those three things mean three different things i want to say something like flex is what comes out of the nib and then the, the spring is anyway so this i mess this up continuously it would be good if we would have more clear terminology i agree it would be really nice if we had industry standards. For example, a fine nib is always this fine and a broad nib is always this broad, but they're relative terms, right? And so for what the, I'm, I'm, I'm derailing this question, but I mean, what is broad for one company is completely different for another company. And that I find complicated because you never know what you get. I have, I recently used a double broad steel number six Bach nib and a double broad 18K number six broad nib. It's the same company, both number six, both double broad, but one steel, one gold. And the steel wrote what I would call medium, a medium line, and the double broad, double broad wrote what for some companies is a stub. It was a fat line. And this is the same company. It's not number eight numbers, two numbers, just different material for the nib. That I find very confusing. That was not your question at all. But I thought I'd say it anyway, because I live on the edge. Okay. Um, Jay says, one thing I would be interested in your thoughts on, I wish reviewers would focus on, is the grind and polish and therefore writing experience of different brands nibs. Sailor fine is not the same as a Mont Blanc fine, not the same as Yovo fine, etc. independent of the size of the tipping. The shape and feel is different and I feel it gets lost sometimes. Well, I happen to have just addressed this just by sheer accident, uh, sheer coincidence is the expression. But yeah, um, and then there are, I understand what you're saying, and then there are strange anomalies in my mind, for example, I recently reviewed the Mont Blanc Egyptomania, and the Mont Blanc Egyptomania had an extra fine nib, and it wrote like an architect. 
but a Mont Blanc find is not right like an architect nib. And someone pointed out and said, yeah, all the, all the Mont Blanc extra finds are kind of like architects. That's strange to me. Um, we know that the broader a nib gets, more often than not, they get a little stubby, right? A little bit stub shaped, or I guess stub shaped. Um, that is confusing. Confusing. Yeah. I try to give an impression of the writing experience. And if I notice something that is in my mind a bit of an aberration, like say with that extra fine, I do try to point that out. But yeah, it's um, it's an interesting thing to think about. I'll see if I can if I can implement something like that. Hello, Sue. Always nice to see you. Jude also has appreciated the stoicism videos. Nice, nice. I'm glad. I'm glad you all do. Um, Stewie's dad says, um, "I have some pens that you haven't reviewed that reviewed yet, like the Nakaya. I keep saying Nakaya. My apologies. Nakaya Neo Stand, the Conan Blue Pearl, or even the Park Custom Marushi, to name just a few. Would those be interesting for you to review?" In principle, yes. The, the The problem is I'm hesitant to accept pens from private people. And the reason is this. If a company sends me something and it gets lost in the mail, it's a write-off. If a company sends me something and this, I mean, knock on wood, but I don't believe this ever happened, but a nib gets dropped and it bends out of shape. It's a write-off. If I get sent pens, especially pens in this price range from private people, right? It's incredibly kind they want to lend me their pens. And yeah, it would be interesting to, to review a custom, what is the, the, um, the custom Rushi, for example. But if something happens in the mail, then we have a problem. And that can either be from you to me or from me to you, or something can happen here. And that always makes me very nervous. So I'm, I'm typically quite hesitant to accept pens from private people for that reason, you know, which is just something that I, I always try to, to take into consideration. Okay, so I'm just reading, there seems to be an interest in, in a nib tuning video with an expert. Yeah, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss that with Jack, see what he says. My collection is about 190 pens in total. I have to thank you for that because I started buying pens after I saw one of your videos. $5,000, sorry, 5,000 euros even worse. Later, I do not look back. Thank you, Dr. Brown. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, no, you're, you're very welcome. One of the fun things, I probably told this before, but one of the fun things I, I always find, you know, back in the day when we had pen shows and I was in a pen store, I always found it interesting when when people come up to me and tell me how much money I had cost them. But my favorite thing was if those people's partners were there and then they would start to complain about how much my, well, I mean, complain typically jokingly, right? But how much money I had cost them. Yeah, this is what I do. I always joke that I make, I, I make people want things. Hi, was there ever an ink that you regretted buying? And yeah, noodles. Um, no, I, I look. I, I I I now have this this reputation that I'm I'm completely uh, anti noodles. I'm not completely anti noodles, but I just don't use those inks anymore. And there are others too. I also don't use private reserve inks anymore. It's a personal choice based on some experiences I've had based on some of the things I've read online, most of those inks are probably absolutely fine, but I'm not playing Russian roulette with my pens. So for me, that was, in a nutshell, the reason. Inks that I have really, like very specific inks that I have regretted buying. I particularly remember Noodler's Whaler Sepia that was that was a disaster, that, that was so dry that it would not write, it would not flow out of the pen. Well, that, that was an issue. 
But I mean, there's other inks too, right? I mean, I don't, because now, the reason I make a point of this is that then tomorrow there will be a Reddit thread about SBRE Brown is insane because he's bashing noodles. I wasn't trying to bash noodles, I was just saying. So let me say something else. Gerbin, bouton d'or is a useless ink. I mean, it's very bright yellow. It looks beautiful. You write with it on a white sheet of paper, you can't read back what you wrote. For artistic purposes, great. For writing, useless. Just me, you know? So it's not noodless. It's inks that I don't fully trust or inks that I can't read back. Just saying. Melinda says, good evening. I've enjoyed your pictures of hikes and wildlife on Instagram. Any favorite animals that you've spotted? Um, yeah, I will. Uh, th there's a couple things, uh, animals. Um, I, I have seen a lot of wildlife here. And to me, that is particularly exciting. That's why I like to share it on Instagram. For the simple reason that from my 11th, I kind of became a city boy. Up to that point, I'd lived in villages. Well, I would occasionally see something in the south of the Netherlands, but then I moved up more northwest and more in this, uh, a much more built up area. And it was much less common to see wildlife there. So for me now, when I go out here, it's insane what I can see here. It's, it's, it's deer, I've seen foxes, moose, a lot of rabbits. A lot of squirrels, but I mean, you know, you can see those in a lot of places. Uh, a bear, a wolf, coyotes. So there's a lot, and to me, it's very exciting because I'm simply not used to seeing that. Just just a couple of weeks ago, I left my parking lot, and I kind of live near the edge of the city. But I was driving down and there's just a row of houses with a fence and then a couple of trees and there was a deer right there. To me, that's very exciting. I, I just enjoy that a lot. So I know if I have an absolute favorite animal, I think what, what I enjoy most about it is the experience of seeing that just out in the wild. And especially here, uh, if I drive around here in winter, when the sun sets at 4.30, it's dark. And you drive and there's big deer just walking down the street by the five, six, seven of them. That's, to me, a very interesting experience. And I, I find that really cool. I may have to be careful, but I find it quite cool. Carol says, glad you are reading Sagan's Demon Haunted World. I read it 10 years ago, still haunted by it. Yes, yeah, fantastic book. I read it a while ago. I just I just recorded an Instagram video of me reading a part of it. But that was the first Carl Sagan book I actually read. It, yeah, fantastic. That, that I think should be obligatory reading in schools, for example. That should be part of a school curriculum. Yeah. What else do we have? You partnered with Diamine and Akamon to have your brown ink, do you have plans to team up with a pen manufacturer to make SBRE brown model of a specific brand? Yeah, I should really make work of this. What I wanted to do, and now that you're all here, we have 95 people in the audience. Um, I was thinking, and I'm not saying that this will happen, right? I said, I was thinking of contacting Salvatore of Leonardo to do some sort of SBRE brown pen. Most likely, I assume, what that would mean is an existing model in a finish that is used for my pen and then will not be used again. Because creating a whole new model from scratch is a lot of work and typically is much more expensive. The reason I would go with Leonardo is that I don't want to attach my name to a super expensive pen. If, if there is to be a pen that is an SBRE brown pen, then I would like it to be as affordable as possible. Now, I mean, to some people, anything beyond $10 is not affordable. So th the reality is I can't please everyone. But a $150, $200 pen, that, that might be reasonable. 
You're also talking about fountain pens. It's it's not going to be a pen made in China. It's not going to be that. I briefly mentioned this to Salvatore at some point, and he seemed quite enthusiastic about the idea. So I have no idea how that will work. But it happens to be my summer break. I'll reach out to him. Please let me know if this is something that you would consider. Obviously, it would depend on the material and the price. I understand all that. But basically, the idea, right? Just that, the idea a Leonardo SBRE Brown. Would you go for that? I mean, and again, I understand it would depend on the material you would, but but in principle, do you what do you think of the idea? All right. <clears throat> what is your asks Waski Squirrel? What is your favorite thing about moving to a rural part of Canada from the Netherlands? I won't judge. I live in North Dakota. Um, I was kind of alluding to it just now, um, and to me, the space and nature is is really nice. It's really nice. I live in the this uh, sort of a, a column of three cities here. There's Edmonton, Red Deer, and Calgary. I live in Red Deer. I, I find myself driving to Calgary once in a while. And when I do, I have the Rocky Mountains on my right hand. And it's it's beautiful. It's I, I've always loved the mountains. I have a godmother who lives in Austria and the Alps. So that I, I have grown up more or less in Alpine mountains. And I get that feeling again being here and that the the nature, the vast expanse, the, the, the space, that is something you cannot find in the Netherlands, not on that scale. We don't have mountains, period. I think the highest hill is something like 300 meters. So that's, you know, um, but that, that I find very interesting. Nature, the surroundings, the space, wildlife, that to me is, is most appealing. Yeah. Flex, springy or whatever, you'll know what they mean if you study copper plate or spensium with a dip nib. Yeah, exactly. And I don't. And and that's, I copper plate, I have the deepest respect for the people who do spensium in a copper plate. I can't do it. I have too heavy a hand. And so the, the super light touch, it's just not for me. And that's fine. It's, it's just a... To quote Clint Eastwood, man's got to know his limitations, you know, and that's that's one of my limitations right there. I can't do that type of calligraphy, probably can't do any calligraphy, but I, mean, I probably shouldn't be doing any calligraphy, but I suck most at those types of stuff. It just, it just ain't happening. Have you cooked anything new lately, something that sticks out as a keeper? Um, it's... Well, I, 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 I don't know if I talked about this last time, but I, I actually started baking naan, naan, naan bread, but naan means bread, so naan. Um, and that has been a lot of fun. It was a lot simpler than I thought. You will not be surprised to know I don't have a tandoor oven, uh, but you can, you can um, make a pretty good dough that rises and then you can just pan fry it and you get a pretty good result barbecue might be even better in any case that works pretty well and that has been a lot of fun that's been a lot of fun the next thing i was um watching a video today because i when i go to earl's uh, which is a chain restaurant in north america my absolute favorite dish is nashville hot chicken sandwich hot chicken crunchy fried chicken it's not good for you but it's delicious. Uh, and I just watched a video on how to make that. So I'm probably gonna try and do that one day. That was a lot more involved than I thought it would be, which even included using, I'd never seen that in a recipe, but I thought it was cool, using pickle juice. So the actual, like the, the liquid from the pickle jar, you put some of that, interesting. So I have to try that one day. I shall report back. What else do we have? Best pens for hiking. Um, in my mind, not a fountain pen. I have, I don't have it here, but I reviewed it a while ago. The that's a pen that I actually do take on a hike. Uh, there is the uh, the uh, Wuben um, E sixty one, I think it was called, which is a ballpoint, but it also has a glass breaker and it has a light on it. Uh, for those of you who are interested in that kind of pen, I'm actually. Um, I stayed in touch with Wuben, 
and they're sending me another pen now, which is a tactical pen, uh, which has a detachable flashlight and a, a pen and a glass breaker, I think. Uh, that's This stuff is really not for everyone, and I fully understand that. Uh, but I also know that I have quite a couple of people in the law enforcement industry watching my channel. And for those people, um, or for those professions, I should say, often I find those those reviews are, can be interesting. Fountain pens and hikes. I, I know that people do it. I, I, to me, it's a no. It's not. That's. I don't think that's very practical. I mean, to each their own, obviously. But that's not something that really works for me. All right. Um, Jude asks, have you ever considered giving up teaching and just being a superhero full time? I've considered it and I I I think um I think my because the next question is then what's your superpower? I think I would just nag people to death. I really think that that would be my superpower. I just keep going and going. And it's always fun, like especially when I when I have like Eric, you know Eric, right? We, we do these these videos the end of the month together. Now we've done other things in the past. When Eric, the best thing is face to face, but when we do Skype or when we we phone each other, what typically happens is I will say something like, "Okay, well, let me tell you quickly," or in a nutshell, and then I just hear him guffawing on the other side because he knows full well that when I say I'll tell you a short story 15 to 20 minutes will pass and I will go off not so much on tangents but I will I always feel the need to set the stage and build up an entire context for a certain story that then afterwards is typically pointed out to me you know that the first 10 minutes they were completely unnecessary you could have done just the the final final things, and I was, I I was I, I it's it's sarcastic now to say I'll, I'll make this brief. I was just now right before this I was watching a video uh, by Billy Connolly, the Scottish comedian, and I find Billy Connolly's humor typically very funny, very funny. He's one of the few comedi comedians who actually makes me laugh out loud. And Billy Connolly does the same thing. So we had this sketch about Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson was filming um, Rob Roy in, in Scotland and uh, Billy Connolly was there in a hotel. Liam Neeson came by and they're friends. I'm doing the slightly faster version of this story. And there was the armorer who was working on the movie who has all the bombs and the guns, and the gunpowder, and he's in his car and he's driving from one place to the next. And all of a sudden there's a bump and he looks and he has hit a cat. And he looks, he gets out of the car, he looks at the cat, the cat looks like it's in pain. He goes to the back of his car, he, he grabs a hammer and he and he kills the cat because he wants to put it out of his misery, right? Which is terrible, right? But, but, but I mean, the cat's in pain. Then a woman comes out of the house. And she said, what are you doing to my cat? And he said, well, I'm so sorry, but I just hit it and, and uh, the, the, the cat was in pain. He says, no, it wasn't, the cat was happy. Then she calls the neighbor. The neighbor comes out of the house. The neighbor is a constable, the police. He says, well, what's going on here? And the guy says, well, I'm terribly sorry. I just hit a cat and it was, you know, I had to put it out of its misery. So I just hit it with a hammer. And the constable says, well, let me, let me just see what's going on here. So, okay, well, you have, you have skid marks here and you have blood on the front wheels. And, and he looks at the back front wheel and there's a dead cat under it. And that was the punchline. So basically, the guy, the guy has killed the wrong cat. <laughs> Although that's a, it's a really bad story. It's, I mean, I'm assuming it's not really true anyway. But I, but but that to me is really funny that you have this whole much of this story. Most of the story was not necessary. Liam Neeson was not necessary. The, the armor it doesn't matter who it was. That was just a guy who thought he'd hit a cat. So th the first five minutes or so of that story. Are just unnecessary detail and i love that i love that setting up that context in so much detail and that's kind of how i tell stories too so i think if i were to be a superhero that's what i would do i would nag people to death by just going on and on and on. they would you know they would just give up okay what else do we have
Regarding the terms wet and dry, I don't agree. They do both apply to both inks and nibs, and in the past I have successfully used a wet ink to compensate for a dry nib. Yes. Ah, and I see that too. So, again, I think it's a bit of a, a semantics thing or a terminology thing. Yeah. Yeah. I watched your old videos and found that you are a Pelican fan, but in some at some moment you stopped uh, posting new videos of Pelicans. What has changed? What happened with your collection of Pelicans? I don't own any Pelicans. They're all sold off. Um, it's not that they're bad pens. It's just that I found other pens that I like more. And it's an important point because I, I often have this discussion when I do the, the, the goat pen videos, which are not actually goat anymore, greatest of all time, because every year there's another one. But, but in any case, Every single time I, 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 I get into discussion with people who say there's no Mont Blanc, so it can't be greatest of all time. There's no Pelican, can't be greatest of all time. There's no Noodles, can't be the greatest of all time. Uh, there's no Parker, can't be the greatest, etc. First of all, those videos are my personal favorites. But I think what you have to bear in mind is if those pens are not there, that doesn't mean they're bad pens. It just means that I have found something else that I like more. Now, when it comes to reviewing pelicans, I still review pelicans. <clears throat> I have one right here that is about to be reviewed. This is the pastel green. Funny story. So sit down for 20 minutes. Um, I was contacted by uh, Endless Pens last year. They sent me a parcel of stuff to review. This was June 2020. Somehow it got lost. But this is when the whole pandemic was kind of initial peak and everything was was terrible. Mail took months to arrive from uh, the US to Canada. And um, I contacted them and said, I'm sorry, I'll keep an eye out for it, but it seems to be gone. It, it, it moved into Canada and then tracking stopped. It was, I, nothing happened. Last week, all of a sudden, there's a ring, it's the mail. Uh, not mailman, mail lady it was, with a parcel. I think, what the hell is that? I'm not expecting anything. And it was the Endless Pens package. This was July 2021. So it had taken a year to get here. And among them was this, the M200 Pastel Green, which um, is a little bit small for me, but I will say it's a very pretty material. I'll block out my face. Um, it's very nice. It's very nice. So that's coming up. So there is a pelican coming up. I really appreciated the discussion on collecting versus accumulating. I have decided I'm a pen user so that I will let go of even amazing pens if I don't love writing with them. To me, that's the very way to do it. Um, that video sparked some controversy once in a while because some people disagree with the distinction between um, collecting and accumulating. And that's fine. That is wrong. But, uh, <laughs> but I think what's very important to, to remember, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, is you have to do what makes you happy. And if that means owning 20 pens, fine. If that means owning one $5,000 pen, so to speak, own wife, own wife, no, own one $5,000 pen, right? If that means owning $605 pens, own six $500 pens, but do what makes you happy. And don't let, let yourself be talked into, and this happens easily, especially with the social media that we have, that people post something, you think, oh, I want that, or worse, I should want that, because everybody's talking about this pen, so I should probably get one too. Buy what you like and then use it. I, I have the deepest respect for people who buy, say, every Mont Blanc Writer's Edition, never open the box, leave it on a shelf, glass cabinet, so they have... That's a real collection. But I don't see the joy in that. If you purchase something, then also use it. That's just my opinion, right? But but that that's... Yeah, so I I, I think in my mind, you're doing the right thing by getting what you want and selling off what you don't want. 
I just sold, here's another, this ties in a little bit to the, the Pelican discussion from before. I just sold Omar's Grand Paragon Arco, Arco Celluloid, beautiful pen. Arco Celluloid, super hot. Was there anything wrong with it? No. And then people said, didn't you love that pen? Yeah, I did. But I've had it for a while. I have three Arco pens. I have a Paragon Grand. I have an Old Wind Classic. And I have an Armando Simone Club Bologna Extra. To be honest, I probably use the Bologna Extra most. And after that, the Old Wind. And after that, the Paragon. There was nothing wrong with it. Absolutely stellar pen. But why would I keep it? if I can also sell it and go to someone who really wants that pen, then that person can do that pen justice. And it went to a very nice person too that I happen to know. So to me, that's how I want to be. And I also felt like I was, I, I, I was accumulating too many pens. I had too many pens. It was making me uncomfortable. And that can happen too. And I get that once in a while. I want to narrow it down to those things that I love. And it's hard, like letting go of that Paragon was a little hard because yeah, it was a very nice pen that I really loved using. But again, relatively speaking, it wasn't used or being used enough in my mind. I have to now go to someone who will use it a lot, then in my mind, that's, that's better. Who do you think will win the European Cup this year? Soccer is the national sport of my country and I have never had any interest in it. So the only reason I, 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 I say that is that I don't even know who's in it and who's left. I simply don't know. So I can't tell you. I bet it won't be the Netherlands. That I, I do have a pretty good feeling for. What do you think about Baron Fig journals and or paper blanks journals? I've used Baron Fig, but not a lot, and it's a while ago. So I feel that I would do it injustice if I would now talk about it. I seem to recall I had a pretty positive experience with it. When it comes to paper blanks, um, paper blanks I have used. I have found the paper to be a little bit variable, but overall quite fountain pen friendly. Not perfect, but quite fountain pen friendly. And often they're very attractive covers so that's really nice would you happen to know when the calgary pen club will resume having pen meets i've yet to be able to attend one meet in the last two years uh, there is talk of resuming and uh, now that a lot of people are vaccinated uh, and with um, the restrictions being lifted a bit I do think it'll happen. That's it. So I, there is no set date, but there have been talks. So I would I would keep your eyes peeled for it because it, it will happen, I think. What else do we have? Melinda says, agreed, there's nothing like seeing animals in the wild. I know, yeah, it's, it's uh, oh, beavers. I, I left out beavers earlier. Beavers and muskrats I've seen in the wild. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it is exciting. It is to me as well. Marie says, I'd be interested especially if a grande. So this would be a Leonardo SBRE Brown collaboration. Yes, I would buy one. Yes, this is SBRE Brown Leonardo. Very interested. Okay. Yeah. Jenny says, what kind of finish are you thinking for your pen? I like the idea of hoping for something that matches the ink. Well, if it would be up to me, I would say Brown Arco because it's a beautiful material, it's brown, and it, it, I think it does match my ink very well. But knowing that the stock of Arco is limited and that that would make it a four-figure pen, I don't want to do that. However, I don't think we should look down on a very good acrylic. Look at the primary manipulation material that Jonathan Brooks has created and that so it was Jonathan Brooks, wasn't it? Now suddenly I have this thing of, was it Jonathan? Anyway, that, that Leonardo has used. That stuff is insane. Insane. So if there would be something like that with some sort of brown in it, then I'd be game for sure. But it will also depend on what Salvatore can work with. I'm going to make work of this because there's a number of people um, 
I'll make work of it. Most likely, I would assume this would be a, a limited run. I would probably like a grande because that would be my preferred size. Maybe we could offer something in a grande, non grande. I, I don't know. I think this, it's easy for me to say. If Salvatore says, sure, we can do a grande and a non grande, it's $100,000 up front, then I can tell you right now that it's not happening, right? So I also have to look at what, you know, how all this works. Having said that, enough interest, I think, to try and make something happen. Okay. I am moving on. Uh, this is an interesting question from Iron Mike. Not pen related. When a person's got amnesia, how are they able to remember words, how to speak, and other things we take for granted but have learned yet don't remember names, faces, places, etc.? Um, that's interesting. An interesting question. I. It, it it depends, also a little bit on. What kind, of amnesia you're talking about. But having said that, I think it's a matter of partially different brain areas because you can have a graphia or a lecture where you can't write anymore or you can't read anymore. That's not typically an amnesia thing. That is damage to different brain areas. When we talk about amnesia, often we're talking about damage to the, the hippocampal complex, um, which is important for the formation of memories. But you have to make a distinction between anterograde and retrograde amnesia. So in other words, there is an incident at some point, right, which could be surgery, it can be a traumatic event, I mean like a brain trauma event, an accident, something like that. Some people develop anterograde amnesia. Most famous case, HM, Henry Malaysen, who had bilateral resection of the, um, basically the hippocampal complex. So on both sides was cut away because he had epilepsy. In a nutshell, he couldn't form new memories. So that is anterograde, right? Moving into the future. But then there is um, retrograde amnesia, which means that you have an incident and you can't remember anything from before the incident. Now, this can be, you can't remember anything up to five years before the incident, or 10 years, or one year, or absolutely nothing, right? It depends on how severe the, the, uh, the, the extent of the damage is. What's interesting, I think, and I think that's the, the um, probably part of the answer to your question is, think of different brain areas and different types of memory. For example, HM could not form any new memories, didn't learn who the new president was, didn't learn any of that stuff. Um, painful in some ways, I mean, in many ways, but didn't remember the death of uh, family members, for example, and kept asking about them while they actually passed away. But he could learn new motor skills. And that has led to the idea that there might be different kinds of memory for different kinds of phenomena, factual information versus skills, for example. And within factual information, there is different memory, uh, a different memory bank for personal related memories. Standard example, your first kiss. You remember who that was with. You remember approximately when that was, all those things. That's a personal memory, episodic memory, versus semantic memory, memory for facts. For example, what is the capital of France? And you say Paris, right? Now, people can lose one but not the other. That has happened too. There has been a case of a patient who was more or less okay with factual information, new factual information, but not good with personal information couldn't really store new personal information. So these things do happen. And what that depends on is the specific brain areas being affected. 
in this case, that was really your question. Language and such, whole different brain area. Production of language, um, more comprehension of language, two different areas. And if those are intact, well, then it looks like you're able to speak. And yes, there will be a memory for, say, the meaning of words. Final thing I will say about this is that it's important to remember that memories are kind of stored all over your cortex. So the whole thing. And that's interesting because that means there's not just one area that holds all your memories. That also comes into play. I hope this was a somewhat coherent story. Carol says, do you still enjoy teaching or are you getting burned out? No, I still enjoy it. And I, I do have the good fortune that I, I get to teach things that I also find very interesting. Not everybody does. Um, I have a lot of courses that are kind of neuroscience based, cognitive neuroscience based. And that I find very interesting. So that that makes it very interesting. Um, Statistics, I find interesting. I find it interesting because it's challenging because students typically don't want to learn statistics, have no innate interest in statistics, except for a small handful. I mean, who, who doesn't love math? Dot, 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 right? Um, so no, I, 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 I remain very interested. Another thing that I think is interesting is that even if you have taught a course a lot of times, for example, introductory psychology. I've taught that a lot in the past three years or so. But every group of students is different. And that's very interesting. Even if it's the same material, every group has its own dynamics. Some groups are very quiet. Some groups are very chatty. Some, many, of course, some are in between. But that creates a very different dynamic. So that, in my mind, keeps it very interesting. And I, I really like that. Yeah. All right. We have quite some interest in uh, Leonardo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna talk to Salvatore. Again, there's no promises, right? I mean, I also have to see, I don't know how this works. Again, if he says, yeah, it's a hundred grand, yeah, then it's, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know about you. I don't have that type of money lying around, but, but anyway, well, I, I think we can work something out, not again. Okay. I would have thought, says Jenny, your superhero power was duets with Roger. Speaking of which, how is the old chap? Well, as you can see, he's disappeared because he has moved back to my, my office at the college where come September I should be getting back to. But he's quite all right. He's quite all right. He, he told me this joke this morning. I, can, I, I have to share this with you. See if I can do his voice. It's always difficult to imitate Roger, but I'll see what I can do. I say, <laughs> did you know that the making model of the first computer was? The first computer was an apple. You see, Adam and Eve had one, but it had a very limited memory. It only had one byte, and then it crashed. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm all right. Brian says, I assume the SBRE brown pen would have uh, been a Visconti Opera Master in Arco. Yeah. Um, I once talked to Visconti about custom pens. Um, and I know that other people do it, right? Like, say, someone like, like Brian Greer of, of um, Chatterley Luxuries. But for private people to do that, now, to be fair, I was talking about developing a whole new pen. And that was, that was not something I would be able to afford. So just saying. But yeah, no, ideally an Opera Master in Arco, that would be, that would be superb. Let's see what else we have. Oh yes, Carol says, you are a good storyteller. I recall the story related about a pal telling a story of a large snake. Yeah, that was amazing. That, that it was sizing him up. Yeah, that, that still freaks me out, but I, I do still think it was funny. Yeah, 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 that was a good one. Um, 
at least I thought it was a good one. Steve says that Pelican does look nice. Yeah, it is nice. Again, it's it's an M200, right? So for me personally, a little bit small, but that's not a fair criticism. That's just for me. Uh, but it is it is a it is a nice color. The 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 pastel they have found an actual pastel material. It's always it's light coming from here, so I don't know how well you can see it, but it's um, it's definitely pastel. And the material I clip on my magic device. Um, The pastel material is is quite nice. Yeah, yeah, I quite like that. Yeah, so that should be that should be fun. I have started, says Eric, gifting specific pens to my sons to pair my collection and to give them something long lasting to enjoy and use. I think that is um, a, a wonderful thing to do, and I I think that one of the very special things about fountain pens is that they have stories attached to them. It's such a personal tool that you use and that you you select based on what you like, the the, the finish, the filling, the, the, the filling mechanism, the nib, all that stuff, that it becomes a very personal item. And I think when you can pass something like that on, it's it's very nice and it's it's very special. Yeah, that's that's a nice idea. Do you think the Pelican M1000 is three hundred dollars better than the M800 or M805? Um, for me, yes, because it's a larger pen. Also, the nib is a little bit softer. It's not a flex nib. People buy it and then they spring and they say, "Think that this has happened to me," and then they contact me and say, "I thought it was a flex nib." No, it's not. Never advertises flex nib but it has that reputation of being very springy. It can also spring. I like it because it's a little bigger, a little girthier, a little longer. I don't even know it's that much girthier. It's been a while since I held one, um, but it's it's a nice size. And the nib is really big, which is attractive. I mean, it's a nice looking nib. $300 for me, sure. Yeah, um, I, I think that's... Um, yeah, I I would I would say yeah yeah yeah. So you know, for me yeah. Ivan says a brown lizard skin acrylic. Yeah, something like that would be a very nice thing for for an SBRE brown pen. Which for those people who don't know, skin, it's not like actually lizard skin, right? But it has a specific. It doesn't have a texture. It just looks interesting. Yeah. 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 No, we're gonna we're gonna try. Yeah. Yeah. What else do we have? Does um uh, CTE that's a chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right? Does uh, CTE have a pattern to what part of the brain it affects? I ask as someone who has had seven concussions and a family of Alzheimer's disease, when it, or I always say when it comes to, but I don't know if that's a Dutchism, as pertains to Alzheimer's disease, we know that there definitely is some evidence for a genetic component to Alzheimer's disease. Um, And that's it. So that doesn't mean that if you have family members who've had that you will also get that, but it, it does mean that there is an increased risk, right? Um, um, the, 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 the actual encephalopathy part, right? That is something that is related to traumatic brain injuries right? And to, to repeat it blows to the head. Um, and, and as a result, you, well, maybe I shouldn't say, yeah, I guess as a result, it's fairly obvious in that case. We always have to be careful with correlations, but there, there is a, definitely a correlation between that and dementia. So if 
Alzheimer's disease runs in the family and you have also had concussions, then I just stress this for obvious reasons. I'm not a medical doctor, right? But 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 being someone who, who likes to think he understands the brain a little bit, um, it might be wise to just have regular checkups. Now, it's always a bit difficult, right? Because with Alzheimer's, that used to be only, you can only diagnose that post-mortem by looking at the brain. Um, there are some indicators now of specific chemicals that you can look at in the blood and such. Um, but but regular checkup, keeping keeping a bit of an, an eye on that is is wise. And one thing that I found very interesting, and that is something that you you could bear in mind, which might be fairly common knowledge, but I'll say it anyway. That does seem to be an interesting correlation between loss of smell and dementia. So if you find that your sense of smell is declining, which is something you can test quite easily, right? I mean, you sniff something that, that has a strong smell. You find that that is decreasing. That might be a good moment because that's typically quite an early indicator. That might be a good moment to have a chat with a neurologist. That's, that's what I would say. Again, this is not medical advice, but this is just well-meant advice based on how I understand um, dementia and such. Ms. Woodhouse says, that's really interesting because this leads into the study of the brain and autism. Yes, which is uh, very interesting. That's the, we're getting into the, that was into the, um, the, the memory discussion we had earlier. It is interesting. And there, I think there is an increasing understanding of a lot of psychopathologies. I personally like that term a little bit better than because that, in my mind, that always sounds like there's something wrong with someone. Um, which, you know, it's a little different from, from a pathology. Um, I think we, we understand a lot of psychopathologies increasingly better. And there are still some mysteries to, to solve for sure. But I think in all honesty, we, we have learned more about the brain in the past 10 or 15 years than we've had in the past 100 years. So give it another century, right? See where we are in 2121. If there still is a human species at that point, um, I think we, we will have made tremendous progress with understanding these kinds of, of psychopathologies. And that is very interesting. And in a way, I think sometimes promising because the better you understand something, the better you're able to, if not cure it, then at least treat it. Right? Jenny says, this is again still about the, the memory discussion, but it sounds kind of like filing cabinets. I wonder if everyone stores in the infra in the same way, in the same filing system. Um, yeah, th there are different theories about how we store memories. And, and I want to keep it this a little short, simply because not everyone finds neuroscience equally interesting. Um, that the hippocampus is important for consolidating memories is, is, I think, pretty well established. The really interesting question is what exactly is a memory because no one has been able to sort of point at memories in the brain so i think the understanding that we have now which i always find a very interesting way to look at it is that you have all the different parts of your brain that do different things parts that do vision and parts different parts that do hearing and different parts that do smells and all that kind of stuff and what people think, or at least some people think now, what a memory is, is kind of like a snapshot of brain activity. So imagine that you walk into a bakery and you happen to store that as a memory. Then you have all kinds of things. You have the, the visual aspect of all the bread. You have the smell of the bakery. You have the, the temperature. It's quite warm. So different parts of your brain are active. And that is just sort of snapshotted, right? All those neurons active at that point in time. And 
we, some people think that is the memory. And when you reactivate that memory, those same neurons are activated again, a little less strongly than in the actual situation. But that's basically it. So it's like making a photocopy of whatever is active at a certain time and that that then is the memory. And that I think is a very cool way to kind of visualize what happens in your brain when you form a memory and how you form it. That's a whole different story, which is quite complicated. And of course there is a brain area the whole hippocampal formation and some other areas that actually do the storing of that memory, but that what that actual, what we call memory trace is, might well be that sort of snapshot of focal brain activity. I think is interesting. Maybe you think it's interesting too. Maybe you don't, but what choice do you have? But listen to me, to me right now. Okay. Um, now that you have SBRE brown ink, you need to make SBRE black. Yeah. I've heard that before. Um, <clears throat> there's been some demand for other colors, including blue. I don't know if it will happen. I know there is some interest. But I would really, the, the Diamine will do it without an issue. I would really have to talk to Paul Rutte of Ackermann because someone also has to sell it, right? I don't want to sell it myself for the simple reason that that's a lot of work. Think about what it means if I get a five liter bottle of ink from dye mine, I have to decant it into other bottles, I have to create labels, I have to put it on a website, I have to deal with orders, I have to deal with customers, I have to wrap it up and ship it. That is a job in its own regard. And I'm not saying that I'm lazy because I, I like to think of myself as all, all sorts of things, but not really lazy, but it's a lot of work. And that means that I am incredibly grateful for the whole infrastructure that Ackermann offers because they do all the hard work. My main involvement with the ink is that I email Diamine and say, I need another 40 liters, deliver it to Ackermann. And everything else is done. The bottling is done, the labeling is done, the, the shipping is done, all of that's taken care of. Uh, and that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So if I add another color, then they need to accommodate that in their infrastructure. They also have their own inks and they have gourmet pens ink and they have the Dutch masters and they have, you know, so there is a lot going on there already. So I don't know if any other colors will really happen, but I can at least ask Paul. Let's see what he says. Uh, Carol says, always a joy to see you and visit. Hope you're doing well, enjoying all the days and nights. I absolutely am. And the one thing that I'm still looking out for, because you said nights, is the northern lights, which apparently have been seen where I live. It's not an every night occurrence, it, but, but it, it can happen in the right circumstances. So that's something that's on my list. Keep you posted on that as well. Um, Yes, Carol says, loss of smell could be uh, the, the, the Parkinson's, horrible disease that took my dear father away twice, once by his wonderful uh, person and their complications by body. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're absolutely right. Parkinson's also has loss of smell as a, um, um, an, an early diagnostic sign, which is, I don't, I don't mean to, um, um, because it is, it is tragic obviously, but it is interesting that that does seem to be that that relationship with, with smell disappearing. But yeah, you're right. There are a couple of neurological things. And right now, of course, I just selected a new textbook um, last year for a course that I teach called Sensation and Perception, which is one of my favorite things to teach because I think the senses are, are super cool how that works. And that book had just come out. Um, November 2020, and they, they mentioned this, obviously, but they also mentioned COVID. It was, to me, it was fascinating to, to read a textbook and see, and of course, early loss of smell can also be an indicator of someone contra having contracted COVID. So I thought that was interesting as well, that that's already in a textbook. I don't know if this was an interesting anecdote. I found it interesting because you read, like you read about what's going on in the world in a textbook that you're teaching from. To me, that was interesting. Uh, <clears throat> What are the long-term effects of prescribed stimulants for ADHD? I'm looking to treat mine, but I don't know whether to go to the stimulant or non-stimulant route. 
um, stimulants, think of Ritalin, that kind of stuff, um, can lead to some issues with, for example, sleeping. It can happen because you're stimulating your nervous system, right? And then you you, you try to calm down and then it doesn't happen. So there, there are specific people who uh, take those kinds of drugs right before they sleep. And then they fall asleep is not a problem. And then they wake up, that it kind of works, right? So that, that's one way to do it. Um, any drug, of course, can have long-term side effects. I haven't heard of anything particularly debilitating or something or read about anything particularly debilitating in, in, in stimulant medication used for a longer time. But yeah, you're stimulating your nervous system. So that can have those kinds of things. Sometimes people report anxiety, feeling a bit anxious because you are kind of, you know, um, um, maybe anxiety is, yeah, anxiety, I think it's the best way I can put it. But well, that can happen or, or feeling stressed because you're kind of boosting the whole fight or flight system a bit, right? Um, but that, that's what I would say. So I, I, I mean, you can, of course, would, would be wise, and I, and I know that you know that. I'm not trying to sound belittling. It would be wise to talk to a doctor and, and see what they say. But, but I don't recall having read anything about particularly negative uh, things. Um, what else do we have? You know, I just made my screen, my chat move. Jenny says, this is about the, um, the memory stuff, kind of like a screen save, a grab. Maybe a brain captures snips of uh, information like smell, etc., as a catalog and saves recipes of those snips separately. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And if you find the, if you find the smell interesting, um, one fascinating thing about human beings uh, is that we smell a lot better than we think we do. And there are two things I find interesting. One is they did an experiment where they had a dog track turkey smell across a field. So they actually just rubbed a turkey on the grass. And you can, they, they charted the path of the dog in kind of like a zigzaggy pattern, sniffing, and then finding the turkey. But then, I mean, what a time to be alive. They did a similar thing with human beings, but they smeared the, the grass with chocolate. So I mean, you can't see it, right? but they just sort of created a, a chocolate extract trail on the grass and then they had people get down on all fours and sniff and follow the track and believe it or not it turns out that people can do that pretty well so you can snort sort of this big they can sniff the chocolate and you can follow along you can't see the chocolate but you can you can smell it and follow the trail of chocolate pretty well whoa i know now the second thing i find interesting about smell is we don't know how many smells we can smell, but I, I, I won't get into too much detail here, but it has been suggested by one of these smell researchers, like the big smell researchers, that we may be able to smell up to something like a trillion different smells. This is more than hues we can see. We can smell more, probably because the smell is an older sense. So it's evolved along, it's very, very fine tuned. But you can't smell it, even if that is true, and you actually you can distinguish a trillion smells. Think about smelling something once every second, and then do the calculation of how many seconds go into one trillion smells. That means that in your lifetime, you wouldn't be able to smell everything you can smell. Now, even if that's an exaggeration, even if you can only smell a billion things, even if you can smell only a million things, the fascinating thing about human smell is that we are much better at um, smelling itself than in interpreting the smell. So when you have someone smell something and you ask them, what was that? A lot of times they say, I don't know. But what, what they can do is affect. So they can say, well, it was nice or not nice. When it comes to actually labeling, recognizing a smell, people are not that good. We can distinguish all sorts of smells. Say, no, A is different from B, and that's different from C. But then interpreting what it is, that turns out to be a lot harder for us. 
fascinating. I find that fascinating. Jackie asks, let me just take a sip, Jackie. Hang in there, Jackie. Don't go away, Jackie. Are you still there, Jackie? Okay. In your estimation, what is the best text on cognitive neuroscience for a layperson with a solid foundation in science? The, the absolute um, standard book I will grab and I will show you because I have it here is oh, Kandel, Schwartz, Jessel, uh, what is it? Siegelbaum and Hutzpeth. I, don't, I probably didn't pronounce that last name correctly. Principles of Neural Science. Now, this is a beautiful book, which is very good. Um, it's also as big as my fist, basically. So I don't know if this is something you would want to read cover to cover. If you want to learn more about cognitive neuroscience, um, there are a couple books that I found really good. One book that focuses a little bit more on the neuroscience than the cognitive neuroscience. It's called Neuroscience uh, by Purves, P-U-R-V-E-S and some others. But if you Google Neuroscience Purves, then you will find that. Um, that I thought was a very good text, very well written. And it's a textbook. So it's not a super specialized handbook. It is a textbook, so it's quite accessible. That you might find interesting with a science background for the sort of neurophysiology aspect of it. That's a very good book. I recently read, I'm just trying to remember the title. I think it was Neuroanatomy Through Clinical Cases. That is very good. It has a lot of uh, neuropsychology stuff in it, slash neurology in it, because it's kind of a medical textbook, but it does have very good anatomical uh, explanations in it. But you have to enjoy that because then there's a lot of patient stuff in it. If you don't find that interesting, but you really want to learn about the brain, uh, Nolte's The Human Brain, it's called that, Nolte's the human brain is very good. That really is an anatomy text. So that really discusses the anatomy side of things. Now, the final thing I will say, because I, I, I go on all day, um, the textbook that we use for our, our introduction to quantum neuroscience is called, I want to say an introduction to brain and behavior by Kolb, Wishaw and Teske, which I'm very happy about because they're three Canadian authors. That is, a, I found that a very nice introduction with very clear illustrations. Um, I'll do one more. If you want an introduction that is very legible and that's not too long, the book The Mind's Machine by Watson and Breedlove is very good because it's a bit more concise. That, if you just want a more or less quick introduction to, to cognitive neuroscience, the mind's machine is is a is a good place to start. I hope that helps. Uh, let me see. I'm uh, Carol. I'm an artist, and I love texts on artists and brain conscious, like the Age of Insight by Eric Kandel. Yeah, Kandel is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> She also says, I met you through pens. I enjoy your talks about science. Yeah, th thank you. Um, it's not for everyone. And I fully understand that there are people uh, who would take the stoicism videos, for example. It, my, my YouTube channel is primarily a pen channel. And then there are people who say, yeah, I don't care about stoicism. I don't care about philosophy or neuroscience or science or whatever. Fully understandable, right? It's, it's not for everyone. It's primarily pens. And then there is some other stuff. But given that is my channel, I also think sometimes I just want to talk about something else. And then sometimes I feel like having a quick video on anatomy. And now I've, um, neuroanatomy, now I've kind of relegated that to Clive on Instagram. Clive has a, an interesting following. Um, but I like that because it's a little lighthearted and a bit funny. 
So I, I think um, I'm glad you like it. Let me put it that way. And again, I fully understand it's not for everyone. And that makes a lot of sense. Again, it's, it's, it's primarily um, a pen channel. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, yeah, sorry, there's one more. Sorry, because now you get me started on sensation and perception. One more thing, because Jenny says, this explains my behavior near perfume. I catch a whiff of something I like and track it down. Now, here, here's a fun experiment you can do the next time you're in a, a shop that sells perfume. Try out a perfume. Best, try out a couple. If you have a couple on those little, you know, little cards, you can't smell the difference anymore. But, but here's the thing, okay? You can reset your olfactory system. You can step outside, but that's not convenient. Here's what you can do. I swear, you have to try it next time. You sniff a couple things, you can't smell the difference anymore. Sniff bare skin. Not bare skin, but bare skin. And then sniff. And then you can smell the difference again. That resets your olfactory system. We don't know why. As far as I know, we don't know why, but it works. And people who create perfumes, for example, obviously are sniffing things all day, they do this. They smell some cotton or they just smell their skin. Obviously not with perfume on it. It has to be just bare skin. Try it. Try it next time. See if that resets your olfactory system because it's really cool. And again, we don't, know, we don't fully know how it works, but it does something, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I just have to share that as a useless bit of trivia. Um, Subhashish asks, do you read fiction favors? Do you consider publishing a summer reading list, fiction, nonfiction? Yeah, I, I was thinking about doing some sort of reading list. We did talk about this a bit earlier. I do read fiction, not as much, but I do read fiction. Do I have any favorites? Um, yeah, but it depends on my mood. So there is that, yeah. Carol also uh, recommends Oliver Sacks. I have still not read anything by Oliver Sacks, but I'm going to move him up my list uh, because I, I have, I have, I know of him, obviously. I know of his work. I just want to read some of his stuff because it, it's, it sounds very interesting, yeah. What can one do to snap themselves out of what I would call, um, a depression funk? Well, that's a complicated question, and that depends strongly on how severe the depression is. The best thing to do is to seek help, right? Um, and a clinical depression is typically not something you, you, you snap out of easily. That may require some medication. That typically also requires some therapy, and the combination of those two can be very helpful. So that is really something I would I would seek help for, especially if it's a recurring thing, if it's something that really lasts long. Now, if it is not that, if it's just a matter of feeling um, quote unquote depressed, feeling kind of like being in a funk, then remember the stoicism, because I think that is something that can be of a lot of use. And just the simple basic principles, right? Some things are under your control, other things are not under your control. That already can make a big difference. The one thing that I found very helpful, find very helpful, is things are what you think about them. It's not things that really bother you, but it's how you think about them. And if you can learn to change your thought about a certain thing, sometimes that makes it easier to process that thing, think about that thing, etc. So that can really help too. Yeah. John says, I've been enjoying all your content recently. Are there any pens or inks you're looking forward to recently? Um, well, there's always things I, I, I'm looking forward to. So as I said, Endless Pens, they, they sent me this. That's a review that's coming up. Um, they also sent me this, which you know is not that new anymore, but it's new to me. It's the Lamy Safari. I think that was the candy or something, the mango. That was the tie-in with the, the, the mango ink. Um, this, I think, is actually quite nice. I'm not a huge safari person. That's just me, right? I'm not a huge safari person, but this, I think, is quite attractive. I really like the yellow clip. And overall, it's always, it always shows up a bit 
differently, I think, on camera. But I, th I find there's a really pleasant mango is exactly the right uh, description. It is that color. It's not exactly yellow. It's not exactly orange. It's something in between. I think that is quite, th they've done a good job with this, I think. Uh, it would be really neat if it had a yellow nib. But then when do you see yellow nib? Um, so that is something I look forward to. I look forward to reviewing that. On the one hand, it's it's just another Safari, and that's not meant as a as a criticism. But I mean, I've I've reviewed a lot of Safaris, but I think this one is really quite pretty. I've been having fun with that. Yeah. During pregnancy, I noticed heightened sense of smell. After the birth, I started noticing that my ability to smell uh, gross, putrid things had disappeared. Very weird. That was thirty years ago. Yeah, uh, maybe in changing diapers, you've been exposed to so many interesting smells. No, I'm, I, yeah, it, it happens. And the, the jury is out on, on that. Um, women report very often changes in smell uh, during pregnancy. When systematically tested in a lab, those differences are often not found which is interesting. And I'm not saying that what you're saying is not true. What I'm saying is that it's typically not found, which is interesting. And I don't know what that is, if it's a psychological thing or if it, like whatever is, is going on, but it's interesting because a lot of women do report that. So it's interesting that, um, it's interesting that, that it, it, it is a phenomenon. If a lot of people report it, then, then there's likely something, right? So it's an it's, it's interesting thing, yeah. Yeah, I noticed at some point years and years ago, I um, uh, I underwent leg surgery, and it was nothing. It was nothing. Uh, well, I mean, it was it wasn't it was it was pleasant, uh, but but it was nothing traumatic or something. But I spent about a week uh, in a hospital, and the hospital food at that point was disgusting. It was it was bad. I I I don't want to sound mean, but it was it was it was terrible, very very bland. Later it improved, but it was, I don't know where they got that, but it, it, it barely passes food. But you're also in a hospital where the air is very filtered and you have all that stuff. And I, what I recall, recall is when I came out of the hospital, um, I want to say that was spring, Yeah, I think that was spring. Anyway, I smelled more. I felt that I smelled more. And I think that was simply because I've been in an environment that is fragrance-free and all that kind of stuff. So you just don't smell a lot of things as you're lying in a hospital bed, just waiting. And that I found interesting. So it was my sense of smell and my, my sense of taste. I felt that I tasted a lot more uh, than I than I did before. And I'm not saying that I... I probably tasted just as much as I did before, but because I, I'd been eating very bland food in the hospital, I think that that made it stand out more. So I, I think it's, it's um, yeah, it's interesting how these these kinds of things can, can fluctuate a bit. And I remember walking out, well, not walking, being rolled out of the hospital in a wheelchair um, and, and just having this sense of relief of, I'm actually smelling something that's amazing. So yeah, it's interesting, I think. What else do we have? Please, for the love of life, read an anthropologist on Mars. Yeah, I'm, um, um, yeah, an anthropologist on Mars. Thank you, Oliver Sacks. I'll add it to the list because I'm, again, I, I wanted to read some of his stuff. Anthropology. Just on Mars. I'll, I'll add that to the list. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, you have to start somewhere, and it's, it's good to have have a recommendation. Okay, um, what else do we have? Uh, if you had the official collaboration SBRE Brown Pen, what company would you like to work with, and what would you would it look like? Right. Well, we kind of had this discussion a little bit uh, earlier. Um, I want to try and accomplish something with Leonardo, and and I can talk a little bit as to why. I think 
Salvatore of Leonardo does consistently very good work. He makes nice pens, they write well, they're well received in the community, and they're typically quite affordable. The limited editions are more expensive, the celluloid is more expensive, the piston is more expensive. I understand all that. But a lot of his pens are, I think, quite affordable, relatively speaking, right? But you're talking about luxury products. So that's why I would like to, to work with him. I think it would be interesting. Yeah. John says, I keep trying to find a tactful way to ask this. I hate asking for free advice, but can PTSD be cured or at least relieved? I was diagnosed with it last year. Um, I don't think there's any uh, hesitation in, or should be any hesitation in asking this. So, so please, please don't, don't worry. Um, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not an expert on PTSD, but having said that, as I understand it, um, the the kind of useless non-answer is it depends a bit on how you define cured. The hopefully more uh, useful answer is many people in many cases with proper therapy and or some medication, sometimes specific sort of anti-anxiety drugs can help a bit, at least initially. Um, many people in many circumstances can learn to live with it more. Bear in mind that one of the ways we think about post-traumatic stress disorder is that a powerful memory is created. When a memory trace gets created in a moment that is paired with a lot of arousal, and when a, a cognitive psychologist like me says arousal, we we mean that in the broadest sense of the word, a lot of people are thinking of arousal, think of sexual arousal, that's one type of arousal, but being stressed to us is also arousal. Of someone, if you've been in a, a traumatic situation, that to us is arousing simply because it, it activates your central nervous system. If under those circumstances, a memory is created, which is very likely to happen if something traumatic happens to you, that memory can be particularly strong. Now, there's a lot to be said about this. For example, some people undergo something traumatic, don't develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Other people undergo a similar traumatic thing, develop severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Why? Don't know. Probably a bit of genetics, a bit of how your brain's wired, all kinds of things come into play. But that wasn't really your question. What I'm trying to say is there are different levels of this. What we also know is that when we talk about conditioning, right? Imagine this. I, I, I don't know what's happened to you. I don't need to know what's happened to you. But imagine that something has involved. I was using this as an example. Uh, and I don't, I, 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 I don't want to say anything triggering, but a gunshot was involved. Now, what can happen is that every time you hear a loud bang, you have a startle reflex. No, everybody does. But for someone with PTSD, it will be more pronounced. In a way, that is a type of conditioning. Think of Pavlov's dogs, bell, meat powder, bell, meat powder. At some point, the dog starts to drool to meat powder. If something bad has happened, specific things or even circumstances uh, can be triggering. I had a professor who was cycling under um, a little underpass, Amsterdam, right? And suddenly two guys jumped out from under the bushes or behind the bushes, it was evening, and they hit his bike. He doesn't know if they were trying to rob him or whatever, but he kind of swerved, right? And he cycled away and his heart was beating. Nothing happened, he wasn't hurt, he didn't fall over, but the next, time he was cycling under that underpass he felt his heart was thumping and that's a process of conditioning you now associate what used to be a neutral place with something negative unpleasant and that can be triggering now the good news about that is something that can be conditioned typically can also be unconditioned you can extinguish a conditioned response but that takes time and that takes care and that typically takes well, not typically, that takes 
proper supervision, right? Because just going to the place where something bad happened on your own is probably not a good idea, right? So that, that may typically involve a therapist. So what I'm trying to say is that can PTSD be completely cured? Maybe. That depends on what has happened, how severe it was, how big an effect it has had on you, right? All these things. And that's just something to take into account. With proper therapy, that can make a big difference. And some things may always stay hard, but they may also not, right? So I would say it is, it is not a hopeless uh, situation, but it is an unpleasant situation. And I obviously am, am sorry that you've, you've gone through something that has made you develop that. That's how I would look at it. It will take time. It's not just the effort, it's also the time part. Some time typically needs to pass. And again, in case you were not, do seek out help because with proper help, that can make a big difference. So that that's really what I would say. I hope I hope that that um, gives you some insights. To think about. Um, Thomas says, "Is not the sense of smell the only sense that fatigues with extensive exposure?" Yeah, it depends a bit. In a way, it it, it definitely. Um, you you get a, a type of adaptation, sensory adaptation. We all know this because you, you walk into a place with a very bad smell, it can be nauseating, but if you stay in it for a while, you don't smell that anymore. But in a way, most senses do that to a certain degree. If you keep looking at something, at some point you don't really see it anymore, look up change blindness, for example. Um, but with hearing too, if there's an annoying noise, for example, a loud air conditioning unit or something, if you sit in it for a while, you don't hear that anymore because your brain just tunes that out. And a very clear example, simple example that we all know is your clothes. You're not aware of the clothes you wear, except you are now because now I've said that. So now you're thinking about it. But I mean, imagine what it would be like if you would feel your clothes, let alone say underwear all the time, right? Your skin initially registers that when you put it on, but then that kind of, that sense adapts, you don't feel anymore until you take it off or you put something else on. Or again, someone makes you aware of that. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting that Kandel and Schwartz's Principles of Neuroscience are beautifully written and a pleasure to read. Something I did as an autodidact around uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, it, it is a very good book. And they're also, they're real experts in the field. So my, this is a dangerous thing to say, but my my opinion is always, if it is in this book, then it is true, because I've researched it so well and so vigorously that it's it's a, a very good source. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Has anything come across your desk uh, about a connection between statins and Alzheimer's or other dementia? No, but that doesn't mean it's not there. That's simply not something that I've really ever looked into. So it's an interesting question. We'll write that down for the next time. Marie says, you are a very kind person. The way you have answered difficult personal questions is very sensitive and supportive. Thank you for being so caring. Here's the thing. Um, One of the very interesting books I have read um, is the Hagakure, which is a samurai manual. And in the Hagakure are four, it's a very interesting book. It's in many ways a weird book. It's about samurai, so it's very much about be willing to die every moment. So some of it is a bit, it's a bit more, a bit dark. But in that book are also four rules to live by. This was written, well, actually, long story, but let's say it was written by a samurai as a samurai manual for other samurai. And he has four rules in it. And one of the things he says is, um, his fourth of four rules on living is manifest a great compassion and act for the sake of man. We would probably translate that as humankind these days and not man, but that's a different issue. 
And to me, that has always stood out. Um, I have many flaws as a person. I really do. But I, 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 I do try to care. I really try to care because it's important to me. And when you are in the field that I'm in, I'm again, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I do not give people therapy. I'm a different kind of psychologist. But you choose that field because you have some sort of affinity with human behavior. And in my case, a little bit of the brain. I didn't know that when I started to study it, but it turns out that that's something I have an affinity with. But the most important thing, I think, and that's what I tell students too, when I, when I teach this kind of material, a lot of it is based on neuropsychology, right? So people with specific brain damage who have taught us a lot about behavior, like, like HM, patient HM that I was talking about earlier, they have taught us a lot about the brain and behavior and how the brain works. But what you must never forget is that that was a person. It's a human being who has been through something traumatic or a surgery or something that was botched or whatever, but that's how we have learned. And if you cannot appreciate that humanity behind the whole thing, then you're just looking at the cold science of it. And then I think you are remiss. You have to have that compassion and you have to have that caring. So yes, I, I, I do try to really care. I think it's important. And I think if everyone would care, then maybe the world would be a nicer place. But, you know, things within your control, not within your control, you can choose to care and to try and be genuine. And I like to think that what, what you see in my videos is, is how I am. I don't want the videos to be acted or... Um, scripted I, I i want them to to reflect me as a person and i think that if you don't have that then you you're missing out on something so thank you that's a very nice compliment and i i really appreciate it um let's slowly round this up for tonight because it's been about two hours James says, did I notice Esbury Brown Inc. back in stock? Um, I, last time I checked, it was in stock at Ackermann at least. Yeah, yeah. Queen Card says, I sprained my ankle today and I want to know why. Well, probably idiocy. Like you probably did something stupid. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, it, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, that, that would be me. Like, you see, I, I fall on flat surfaces. So, I mean, that's that's probably it. Um, as someone who had trans labyrinthine surgery for vestibular schwannoma who struggles daily with the uh, effects of a resected eighth trigeminal nerve, I have both an academic and personal interest in this field. My neurologist was so facile about the after effects of surgery, I was left feeling like I was wrong. It took quite some time to accept yeah, the amount of space. Yeah, you see, this is one of those cases, I think, where this kind of emphasizes what, what I was just trying to say. There is a person behind it. And I think that sometimes doctors, uh, and undoubtedly psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever, um, but, but I think sometimes they forget that there are people behind the issue. And some doctors are, many doctors, are, are absolutely wonderful. But in the, the, the best doctors, like I talked about my leg surgery earlier. I had a fantastic orthopedic surgeon. I was much younger. I was, I don't know, 14 or something. So a long time ago. And he did four surgeries on, on my legs in total, both, both legs. And, and he was a wonderful person because he looked at me as a person. And when I would come in for checkups, he wouldn't just look at my legs. He would look at me and he would say, how, how are things in school? How are things going? 
That's not his job. He was paid to look at my legs. But he looked at the entire person. And I have very fond memories of that man because he cared. And it was very clear that he cared about his patients, not the problem, not looking at a patient as an equation of, well, this is wrong, we fix this, and now you're back at zero, so now we're good. But look at the whole person. I think that that matters a lot, and that's what, what makes people so interesting. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. People, it is 9 p.m. here. I have very much enjoyed this hanging out. We should do this again. I want to do these more often again. It's at some point been pushed on the back burner a little bit because there were a lot of things going on. But right now, we should try to do this again. So I'm not saying let's do it again next week, but I will try to do this a bit more often because there seems to still be quite a bit of interest in all this. Um, I very much enjoyed it. It was, it was a good conversation. It was a lot of neuroscience. I don't mind. Um, it's not for everyone, but, but I don't mind. I think it was always, um, I always think that's very interesting. Um, I will politely and unabashedly mention, should you feel the need um, to somehow support the work, don't forget that there is Patreon, patreon.com slash sbrebrown. You can support my work there. You absolutely don't have to, but if you want, you can. That is a way because I often get the question of, is there something I can do to support the videos? That is something you could do. I will love you just as much if you don't, but I'm just saying that is an option. Um, I, I hope you had fun. I definitely did, and, uh, and, and that's pretty much it. So have a good evening, night, whatever time it is. I don't want to steal Penboy Roy's time, but uh, sorry, his line. But um, let's let's do this again. That's it. I shall hit end stream and that's the end of it. All right. Have a good evening. Bye.